You are tuned into the Shattered Podcast, Cellbound Edition, with your host, D. Elias. On today's edition of Cellbound, I have Daniel Luna with me. Thank you very much, Daniel. You're welcome. Uh, I know you're nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Take us back to your childhood. Childhood? Oh, where can I start? Well, I'm from Austin, Texas, born and raised. Stayed over there on 12th Street, 12th and Leslie in Austin. Stayed with my mom and dad. My dad was a drunk. He was always drinking all the time. My mom was always cheating on my dad. And my dad was always beating on my mom for him because he was always working. And he, I guess he finally found, I never realized why they were always fighting and stuff. He would find out she was cheating. Yeah, pretty much she'll be at home working all day and she, you know he'll just come home and she's not there and we're there by ourselves and he'll get mad at her for that. I never really understood why he got mad at her all the time, why he was beating her. I was just trying to stop him from beating her. And I was a little kid. I used to tug on his pant leg a lot. And he'd just kick me off, you know, and I'd just cry like a little kid, you know, go to the room and be mad about it, you know. Couldn't, do, couldn't help my mom out. Right. Yeah. Person I love the most, you know, couldn't do nothing about it. And this happened regularly? Yeah, so it was like every day, day pretty much. Every day. And our house was also haunted. It was built on a World War World War Two graveyard. There was gravestones in our backyard, actually. Wow. A bunch of them, and um, you know, at night we'll hear the toilets flush and stuff get thrown around the house. Lights flicker off and on out of nowhere. And um, how old were you? I was a little little kid, probably about four or five. Maybe. Just very traumatizing, just to say that alone. And I remember that um, the lights would flicker off on sometimes, you know, we'll all be in the house sometimes, and uh, it'll get the flickering off and we'll all get scared and take off, go go around the block, and my mom will call the police thinking somebody's in the house, you know, we'll just start hearing stuff get thrown around. So we'll drive around the block and be on the other side of the block and the light's still going off and on. Once the police gets there, the lights just stay on. <laughs> it, was, it was tripped out, man. Right. And, and, um, We'll be scared to go back to the house. We wouldn't go back for about two days after that. But it was still our house. We had to go back. <laughs> then that lasted about same thing off and on. Um, pretty much started going to school. Oh, while I was little, while I was all that fighting was going on and stuff, my dad, just before I guess, my really got to like early childhood and school and stuff. I guess my dad and he'll be fighting all the time and like he'll get drunk. He'll drink all the time, I guess, so he wouldn't have to worry about my mom cheating on him pretty much because all he did was work. And he'll sexually molest us a little bit. He wouldn't like go over the edge and like that, just rub on us and shit. And I didn't know what what it was at first, you know what I mean? Scared to talk about it. Yeah. It, was uncom it made me uncomfortable. And I started going to school. It lasted a couple years on the school. Started going to school and started feeling like, I never told nobody about it. I started thinking that everybody, like it was written all over my face, I started feeling, you know. So I stopped going to school, dropped out, started hanging around with the wrong crowd. How old were you when you dropped out of school? Probably about 13, 14, something like that. So about sixth, seventh grade? Seventh, I did three years exactly in seventh grade. Never passed it, it kept dropping out. <laughs> Tried to go back, but. They ended up moving me from seventh grade to ninth grade because I was too old. And then I dropped out like after two weeks of being in there again. Just didn't want to go to school. Didn't care about school pretty much. You, I you couldn't handle the family life, so you dropped out and started hanging out on the streets. Pretty much. Then from hanging out on the streets to drinking, led to smoking weed. And then um, this was on the south side in Austin off of Congress and Otorf. Then I went back to the east side pretty much where I, where I regularly grew up in a regular neighborhood. Started hanging around old crowd of people, started smoking weed more, drinking more, ended up selling crack cocaine. Did that till I was probably about 18 years old. Were you in a gang or you just had friends that were? We didn't, wasn't no gang, we just Pretty much. You just hung out with the crowd hung, of people. Hung around with a crowd of people, sold drugs pretty much. Right. And yeah, it wasn't no gangs. 
Yeah, eh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know exactly. Looking how back at it now. Yeah, maybe it was kind of a game, you know. No one allowed nobody else to sell drugs. We was. <laughs> right. But, yeah, other than that, man, I ended up, I think when I was 18, I came up here. No, I just go back to where we was over. I went to my friends that were staying on 12th Street and stuff. Went back to the east side. My dad and my mom, they had separated around this time. So my dad stayed in the house and he got to drinking, started doing cocaine, started doing it so much that, you know, the molestation got a little bit worse. So I kind of quit going home, started staying at my friend's house a little bit more. He's still trying to molest you even as you got way older. Um, no, this was probably when I was about 13, 14. It's because um, I dropped out of school. My mom and dad, they separated somewhere between that little period of time. Right. Then we went back to, to the east side and my dad's family's all from over there. So I don't remember exactly where it was at because it's been so long, but I remember um, we were staying at one of his sister's house or something. I, I really don't remember, to be honest. But the same thing started going on over there. Oh, and my brother was a thief, man. I wasn't really allowed at any of my family's house because my brother, he pretty much stole from all of them. Yeah. And um, ever since he was a thief, they looked at me like I was a thief. When really, I never stole nothing in my life. No. <laughs> well, at least from nobody. You were guilty by association. Yeah, exactly. And everybody judged me for that, you know, and that kind of pushed me away from everybody. You right. know? And my dad, he was always working, and I pretty much just stayed with my friends. You know, I had to eat. And my dad, he was working, but I didn't want to take his money because he was had a drinking problem, a coke problem, and all that. So, you know, I started pretty much raising myself from that point. At this time, my mom's gone. She's in Mexico somewhere. She's on the run from the... U.S. Marshals, something happened to my little brother, and I'm not really too sure what happened because I wasn't there. But, man, I've been all over. Like, in one year, I went from Austin to San Antonio to all this, Cameron, Texas, to all this little stuff, man. And just going through all this stuff when I'm little, man, and, you know, it kind of messed me up a lot. That's why this, the way I am is I'm used to, I never worked before. <laughs> never had a job. Well, I did hold a job for like six months, that's the longest. And that was um, when my mom got out of prison, actually. And I started working with a dude. He's a real good dude. I used to always beat my mom's boyfriends up. I didn't like them because they were Mexicans. Because <laughs> 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 they all spoke straight Spanish. <laughs> anyway, I, I, you know, none of my family speaks straight Spanish. <laughs> And so, you know, and plus my mom left my dad for a Mexican, yeah, you know, I think so I you just it. had some pent-up anger. Yeah. <laughs> and this dude, man, I, I ain't gonna lie, I did try to fight him a couple times when I was drunk, too, but it's just from the past and nothing was against him. But he's also, he turned out to be a good guy, man, and I'm glad my mom's with him now. He's doing good. He gets her whatever she wants. He spoils the shit out of her, to be honest. Right. Oh, I don't know if I can cuss. <laughs> <laughs> so, how old were you when you first went to prison? I was 26, and I went to prison right here in Sevier County. For possession of marijuana? Yeah. I went to, um, I had three delivery charges I didn't know about. So you know, I was fighting this case, possession with intent to deliver, the two pounds and 2.4 pounds, what, what they say. Anyways, I was fighting the case for seven and a half months in here. It was 205 days exactly. I remember it was on my sheet when I went to prison. And um, yeah, I fought the case and it turned out if I, I was hoping to get probation on my first felony or something like that, but it turns out I also had three delivery charges. That was probable cause to kick my door in. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was to get out of it. <laughs> Tell me what it was like in prison. Prison, it was my first time going to prison. I ain't gonna lie, I was scared shitless. I mean, right. sorry about that. <laughs> but you, you were introduced to a whole different society. Right. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. And always. ultimately, that's where your addiction to methamphetamines came into play. Pretty much, because there was really no weed in there. <laughs> there was no marijuana, but you could get meth. Yes, ma'am. And um, 
Oh, first time I went to prison, I went to Malvern. Shit, like I said, I was, you know, scared to death on the cool. Shit bricks. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to Malvern, they hold me in a one-man cell for a week. I get out, and I'm, I'm kind of nervous, you know, I get put in the wow. population, I get put in the population. You know, I've seen blood in, blood out before. You know? <laughs> wow. So, you know, this big old black dude comes up to me, and, you know, he didn't mean no harm, man. He just like, oh, you know, he just wanted to say what's up. Well, I kind of took it offensive, you know, because I seen the movie, you know. You know, big big dudes rape little dudes, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, I almost kind of took off on them on a coup, but some told me not to. And I look behind them, and I see all the friends that I came from county jail with, prison. I see them over there, so I went over there and talked to them for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, the black dude comes over, he's like, hey, man, that kind of scary. I said, like, man, you kind of freaked me out on the coup, man. I didn't know what to do when you came up to me. <laughs> And then he's like, oh, no, I didn't mean no harm, man. I was just trying to say, so it was my first time in prison, too. <laughs> you tell like, him you watch too much television? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I told him, man, I seen blood and blood out before, man. <laughs> my bad. I'm sorry, I told him. <laughs> it's just little stuff, man, you know, that you, you never know, man. To be honest, I never seen no raping in prison or nothing like that. It was a lot of fighting, a lot of riots and stuff that I seen at the prison I went to. And then... Well, let's just go back to the story when I first got to the prison that they sent me to. I was nervous too, man. I get put in there and they just throw me in the population with everybody. You know, they don't even give you a chance to take a shower. They just, <laughs> just wow. throw you in there. <laughs> so yeah, I go in there and this black dude, little small black dude, he's like, oh, you Mexican? Said, yeah, you must be in here for selling drugs. I looked at him like, <laughs> how you know? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I am. Y'all, oh, that's all y'all do is sell drugs. <laughs> So anyways, he took me in there, and then uh, there was no Mexicans in there, and in the whole prison there was probably like seven Mexicans. So you know, I didn't wasn't really with nobody. So the first couple, first couple months I was in there, you know, it was laid back, chill, no one messed with me. And then people started getting transferred from Barner, Cummins, Tucker, Max, and all that, and that's when all hell broke loose. You know, they're bringing the Mexicans are coming from uh, all these different prisons, and they're bringing drugs, and they're trying to make names for themselves, and all this, and I'm just stuck in the middle, and. You know, they're fighting all the time, and, and you know, it's it's a me or you situation of some Mexicans get into a fight in there, you know, if you don't do nothing about it, you know, they're going to violate you for not doing nothing about yeah. it. So, you know, I got into a lot of stuff in there over stuff that had nothing to do with me, you know. It was prison suck, man, on the cool, and then you having to live that society all the time, you know, sleeping with your one eye open, right. <laughs> you never know. On, sometimes, man, we took turns going to sleep, you know. Somebody would watch over me while, you know, I'd go to sleep and then he'd take turns. And um, we did that pretty much the whole time over there. Nobody physically tried to ever harm me or nothing like that, but it was always like dumb stuff. People smoking K2 and stuff. Yeah. People flopping out. Right. So when you come out, you come out of prison addicted to methamphetamines. I wouldn't so much as call it addictive. It's just when I started selling it, and then like I would hold it for so long, I would just be like, you know, fuck it, why not? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, you know, I never shot it up or nothing like you that. You didn't sell it; you used it. Yeah, pretty much. And I, I ended up snoring it. I smoked it. I never shot it up or nothing like that. And I'm scared of needles. <laughs> I wouldn't. I don't, mm -mm. I'm not scared of needles. I'm, I got a bunch of tattoos, but you know, I'm scared to put something right. in my skin. I mean, I've seen, uh, you know, I, HIV is real, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> exactly. And tuberculosis and all that, man, I'm scared of that stuff. So you know, I don't mess with no needles. So, how long were you out of prison before you were arrested this time? Before I was arrested this time, 18 months. But you had some children in, in between. I met this girl. Well, I had children back when I was, like in 2012. That's like a whole nother story, though. I never really, I was in his life for the first two years he was born. And we were supposed to come over here. My baby mama told me that we were going to meet over here from McAllen, Texas. And I came over here. The day I came over here, I never heard from her again. Like five years went by, 
Didn't hear. I went to prison. Everything got out. Didn't hear from. Her. Still ain't heard from her. But I got two baby mamas. And um, last thing that I ever heard from her is the police pulling up at my door, serving me some child support papers. Wow. And that's the last thing I ever heard of her on the cool. And you was during that time you were working. I was. Like I said, I really haven't been working. I worked like out of my whole life, probably like a year and a half. I'm 29 years old right now. I've been selling drugs most of my life. But when you, when they served you the papers and you knew that you were gonna have to start paying child support, you chose to quit and go back to selling drugs. Oh, okay, okay, at that time. I think I was working at that time. My bad. I was working at the plant. Right. And when they served me, I did it go on for a little bit because I remember they started taking money out of my check and my check started getting lower and lower every time. I'm making like 50, 60 hours a week and I'm only bringing home like 170 bucks, 150. Wow. And it'll get lower. I was like, man, I ain't making no money. I can't even pay my rent. <laughs> can't even pay my light bill sometimes. I had to borrow money from my dad. My dad's actually over here and he's doing good now. And I got so much hate towards him. I cannot talk to him. I cannot sit in the same room with him without arguing with him. Wow. And I know he doesn't, he doesn't drink anymore. He doesn't do nothing no more on the cool. He just works. And um, he's not that same person he was back in the day. I ain't gonna lie, I kicked his ass a couple times. And uh, it's just cause the hatred I had from him when I was little. Wow. And um, I, I'm not happy cause I did, you know, I love my dad to death. You know, he was the only one there throughout my whole life. My mom wasn't there and he'll do anything for me. He's He's the one helping me out right now while I'm in jail. And, um, yeah, my dad's, he's cool, man. He just, he's getting old. And I never, like this program, you know, it's teaching me a lot, you know, to forgive and forget. Because if you hold on to it, you know, it'll eat you alive. Right. And, um, so you're in the RSET program right now? Yes, ma'am. And, um, what kind of time would you be looking at otherwise? To be honest, I'm looking at 6 to 30 on one charge and um, 0 to 6 on another charge. So this is giving you the opportunity to stay out of prison and rehabilitate your life? Yes, ma'am. Because, like, if I was to go back to prison, I would just do the same thing again. Right. Well, it's apparent that there's drugs, as, as many drugs in prison as there are on the street. I know that's right. What has helped you the most since you've been in the RSAP program? What programs and services, you know, what do you do on a daily basis that helps you to feel that you can rehabilitate successfully? Well, I really don't know the answer to that question yet. Cause like when I got out of prison, I didn't have no stability, nobody to tell me to check on me or anything. You know, right. I had to see my pro officer once every three months. You know, no one's checking That's on me. That's not very right. Yeah, exactly. In three months' time period, a lot can happen. Exactly, and like in this program, they're gonna be looking at me every day. I gotta take piss tests every day. They're gonna check on me, so there's a lot more stability. Right. But like every day when you get up and you go to the classes, what classes, what are you doing t today, right now, that's helping you in your sobriety? Miss Lynette's class. She's that's the substance abuse class. Yes, ma'am. Right. She's, she's the one teaching me how to let stuff off my chest, let stuff go. She's pretty much, she's the one that's teaching me how to let my anger go, how to let the stuff that I hold in get lit it off my chest. Right. Talk about it. She gives you the tools that you need, the coping tools to it's deal like with your anger and stuff. Yes. Because like usually like if like my girl's in the program too. You know, that's if you look at her, you know, I'll make up a story in my head and I would think something bad real fast. And it really when there's nothing really wrong. And this goes on all the time, I ain't gonna lie. And I'm learning to accept that there's really nothing going on. <laughs> wow. And that's what's been causing a lot of my relationships to mess up on the cool. 
me thinking wrong, but it's just because of what's happened in the past. You know, if my da my dad couldn't trust my mom, you know, how can I trust a female? You know right. what I mean? Oh, you've dealt with so much in your childhood that mm -hmm. has formed your opinion today. Yeah, to not trust anybody. You know, if my my dad couldn't trust the woman that he loved the most, you know, me as that being my mom, the woman that I love most, if he couldn't trust her, how can I trust somebody? And I've been living with that same guilt so long, and I've lost some good relationships, to be honest, just because of that little, what happened in the past, right. pretty much. And I regretted it. You know, I lost my kids. I, I'm thankful, you know, I got one baby mama that still, she still talks to me, and she wants my kid in my life. And I didn't talk to him. When I first came to jail this time, I talked to him for, well, I didn't talk to him for about five months. I've been in here for a while. And then when I, I just started talking to him when I got in the program, talked to him for three weeks straight. And then out of nowhere, two weeks later, no, they didn't answer the phone. And then, you know, out of nowhere, I called her. I kind of gave up on calling him on a cool. I just called him out of nowhere and she answered the phone. <laughs> so I got to talk to him. And then I kind of lost my privileges talking to my girl in the back. <laughs> Where do they live? They stay in Pearsall, Texas. Yeah, I'm not from here, I'm from Austin, Texas. Where do you see yourself when you complete this program? Where do you see yourself going forward? To be honest, um, like I said, the stability that it got in this program is gonna keep me on the right track. The only reason I stayed in this town, to be honest, was to sell drugs. It's all I know. It's where I'm from. It's we get more for less over here. It's more for less. I don't know if I said that right. Right. <laughs> and um, that's the only reason I stayed here on the cool. Like I said, I never really had anybody to tell me what to do. You know. You've never had guidance in your life. Exactly. My mom wasn't around, my dad wasn't around, it was just always me. So now this, when you, when you go into the nine month aftercare, that gives you guidance because you have to follow the rules, you know, you have to pass the drug test, you have to follow the rules. Exactly. That's your guidance. That's what I've been needing. <laughs> right. And I, I told the parole board, you just let me out, I'm gonna do the same thing again. Exactly. To, that is your, your normal because that's all you've ever known. Yes, now you need to think outside the box. And quit and getting the abnormal. Mad. Yeah, and quit getting mad about dumb stuff that ain't happening. Right. <laughs> Learn to forget the past and work yep. on having a wonderful future. Because I got a wonderful girl right now and she's just like me, man. She's been through the most and she's tired of it too. She's trying to change and she got three kids, you know, and I love them to death. Right. Not even my kids, you know, and I love them to death. Cool as hell. Great kids. Mm -hmm. They don't have a father figure in their life, so, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm trying to be their dad, but I'm trying to be somebody there if they ever need someone to talk to. Right. And at the same time, have a little fun with them. Right. <laughs> Do something that I never done with my kids. You know, I never got to throw the football. I never got to throw the baseball when I was little. Never got to go to the bumper cars or nothing like that. You know, yeah. just simple stuff that... You was too busy trying to survive. Exactly. I never rode a four-wheeler, I never went fishing, I never done any of that stuff. Yeah. And when I go now, I, it, I get bored real fast because I'm worried about my next dollar. What am I going to eat? Yeah. So I never had patience for anything. Wow. And um, yeah, I mean, this one thing about this program, it's going to keep my head straight, going to keep me out of trouble, and like you said, it's going to have some guidance in there. And if without guidance, man, you know, I'm just going to mess up again. Right. I'm not scared to admit it. <laughs> you, you need the structure. And a lot of people, and you've never had a structured environment no. at all. And so moving forward, the structure is what you need to help you to maintain sobriety and stay on the right track. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Daniel. I, I wish you all the best going forward. Oh, that's good. I'm doing excellent right now. I got a bad problem talking to my girl a lot, though. <laughs> yeah. But I'm working on it, staying, trying to stay out of trouble. Oh, she's here. 
Yes, ma'am. And she so y'all get in too. trouble trying to talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to talk to her, man. <laughs> Well, in February you graduate, so yeah, you know, I'm learning to accept you're, it. <laughs> you're, on the you're on the downhill slide. It's not that far till February. Forty-seven in a wake up. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the days point. counted down. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, and I, I do. I wish you all the best going forward. Oh yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Please support our sponsor, RenovationTea.com. You'll find a large variety from daily to specific herbal remedy teas, all certified organic and fair trade. Use code SHATTERED and you'll get a 10% discount. You can see the link below.